third, and they're into the stretch, and it's Tis the Law on the outside of Authentic. These two stride for stride as they come to the final furlong. Authentic is dragging in. Tis the Law all out to get by him. Authentic and John Velasquez have the lead as they come down to the 16th ball. Tis the Law is still trying to get him. Authentic, Tis the Law, here's the wire. Authentic has won the Kentucky Derby. All right, welcome back to Racing Rundown on YouTube today. We've got a preview for the 2020 Preakness Stakes, the final jewel of the Triple Crown. This extremely messed up, crazy year uh, has finally cultivated in getting all three of the Triple Crown races in. 11 horses will go to the post for the Preakness, and it's a really fun, really interesting group. Uh, one of the key headliners of this race is the Philly Swiss Skydiver. She's going to be the first Philly to try the Preakness since Rhea Antonia did so in 2000. 14, and she will try to become one of only six Phillies to have won the Preakness. With all that being mentioned, we'll get into this like we do every preview, go through each horse, break them down individually. Eric is here with me, so we got even more in-depth two opinions on each horse uh, for this. So it's going to be a pretty pretty loaded preview, got a lot of opinions to give, and a lot of breaking down to do because horses, a lot of horses are coming out of races that are, are really good on paper, and have a lot of upside in terms of just the overall talent of the horse. So that makes for an even more interesting race. And so we'll pick it up with getting to the first horse, Accession, uh, trained by Steve Asmussen, one of three runners that he's going to have, also owned by Calumet. Uh, if you remember the recent history of the Preakness, Calumet horses have been running really well uh, in, Pre in Preaknesses. They've been second the last two years with Everfast and Bravazo. And they also won the Preakness in 2013 with Oxbow. So if you have a really good memory, uh, you'll probably remember that. But as I did mention already, Accession is coming into this race off of a pretty long layoff. He did run a career best in stakes company in the Rebel in his most recent race. Uh, that was on a day where uh, the front end pace was super generous for him. He got a really good setup and had author, had Nadal, excuse me, not been as freaky as he was that day. Maybe he would have been a really massive upset there. That being mentioned, he is coming in in this race off of a super long layoff, and he fits the mold of the typical Brad Kelly Calumet horse that has just entered in a race like this just because Brad Kelly's mindset is to run a horse in a, a triple crown grade one race when he has the opportunity to do so. But with that being mentioned, there is some upside with him. He is the type of horse that, given that there is a lot of speed in here, more so than the Derby, he might be able to pick up the pieces and uh, run a run a solid third or a fourth, but I don't think any higher than that with him. But he will be coming at the end because it does probably look like it's going to be a somewhat fast pace here. Yeah, the pace is really the only thing on paper that, that makes sense for, for accession. Uh, it's he, I mean, he ran really well in the Rebel. There's no denying that, but he missed so much so much you know racing time that I think that that's definitely going to catch up with him. And I don't know. There's just a lot of things that really have to go his way for him to be contentious. Otherwise, I mean, you look at his form before that. He was losing to decent horses. I mean, Modernist, Enforceable, Mr. Monomoy, uh, all in, the, in his running lines. But at the end of the day, massive improvement is going to be necessary. He's, I mean, Aspison horses don't necessarily work quick in general, but even for Aspison standards, they haven't been pretty. So uh, for me, he's a toss. And I, I, while Jack said the pace will definitely benefit him, he's not the closer. One of the closers, I think, is going to have much of a chance to come late. One closer that may have a chance to come late, though, is the number two horse, Mr. Big News, coming off of a really good eye-opening if you can, if you want to call it that, second place, excuse me, third place finish uh, in the Kentucky Derby. Jay Privman on Racing Rundown when we talked to him about the Kentucky Derby actually said that he would be his long shot play and uh, props to Jay for getting that angle. Uh, but Mr. Big News, the, the, the angle is open back up with him. You know, I think both of us were kind of a little bit discouraged with him coming out of the bluegrass. But uh, if you look past the bluegrass where there were definitely uh, some horses having valid excuses in that and, you know, closers definitely generally not doing too well in that race, uh, but coming back to have run somewhat decent. Uh, if you look at his last two races, the Oakland Stakes was obviously uh, the big headline, but the Kentucky Derby is a very good race. And if you believe in him coming out of the Kentucky Derby and you can believe that the pace is going to be pretty nice, going to be pretty nice for him to get. Uh, and, you know, he, he did have that good third place finish in the Kentucky Derby. If you believe really, really highly in that, then you can definitely make a case for him to run another on the board or in the, in the top four uh, effort for, for him. I still don't think that he would be a winner, though. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that derby win, or not winning, but Rowan was so nice from him. I think um, for a second, I, I, I know I'm not in the minority here thinking that for a second, it looked like he had a chance to beat uh, the top two, at least coming off the turn. Um, but nevertheless, the fact that I think, if anything, I, the, the biggest explanation for him kind of flattening out and still running that third um, and not really sustaining the rally was probably the time off. I mean, he was off for a, almost two months going into the derby. So for him to run third in that scenario, and I mean, in a normal derby, that's basically like, uh, you know, having your last race in early March and race like, uh, you know, the, the, the Tampa Bay Derby or something. So the fact he ran so well, it was really impressive. I mean, I think he can only improve second off the layoff. That's always a, a solid angle for any horse, really. Um, and I, I think that the distance is – the more distance, the better for him. I don't think a mile and three sixteenths is going to be bad for him. And the biggest thing is, of course, the pace. He's going to have something to run into. He's been able to close into slow paces and quick paces, but the quicker, the better for him. And for that reason, I know he's going to be coming in late. It's just a question of who he's able to pick off at the end, who's going to be tiring, who's going to still be sustaining runs, so on and so forth. Uh, big, biggest concern, if anything, the Bluegrass was kind of a weird race for him, but he was beaten by two of the horses in this race uh, on the day in our collector in Swiss Skydiver. So that's my big negative on him is that, uh, you know, while he did run that good derby race, is that he has also lost to this level and slightly worse before. And we'll get into one of the horses that – finished ahead of Mr. Big News, and this this would be one of the, also the first speed horse that we're going to get to, Art Collector, who's coming out of five straight races in which he's crossed the wire first. Uh, one of those he was disqualified due to medication violations by former trainer Joe Sharp, uh, but for, his last four wins have all been very good, and they, they've all been uh, clean victories for him, including two Stakes wins, uh, headlined, of course, by the Bluegrass, where he beat Swiss Skydiver, uh, but he also won the Alice Park Derby prior to the Kentucky Derby. Unfortunately, was not able to make it to the Kentucky Derby due to uh, coming up sore just before he entered the Derby. But aside from that, uh, that setback, he has been very good on paper this year. The question would be is he's still a little bit unproven because if you look at some of the races he's been running in, he, he beat Swiss Skydiver in the Bluegrass, so that's an obvious uh, example of a horse with class that he's beaten. But if you look at the Ellis Park Derby, uh, outside of shared sense, the, the field in that race didn't really do too well in the Kentucky Derby. If you look at the two horses that uh, ran in the Kentucky Derby that he beat in that race, Attach and Rate and Necker Island, both of those horses did not run good races by any means in the Kentucky Derby. So that would be the concern with him. Uh, he's also going to be a speed horse, and you know, as we've been kind of alluding to, we do think it's going to be a pretty quick pace. So the the question would be is would he be able to sustain something like a a, a full on run in the Preakness, or would he flatten out a little bit to uh, come into the stretch? Yeah, that's certainly my biggest question with him. Um, it, 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 his last two races have been a, a tale of, of two trips, both obviously with great outcomes, wins, but they were two very different kinds of races at, at Ellis. He kind of was forced due to his, due to his inside post to, to show early speed and be on the lead. Even though he had pressure coming, to his outside from a lot of different horses, a lot of long shots. Bluegrass, there were horses that naturally just had more speed than him, took the lead from him, um, and he sat you know, third, second, but he was right up there nonetheless, and he was still able to win that. But he does have that small bit of versatility. However, those speed horses he were facing were not – you know, the level of authentic and Swiss skydiver. Well, Swiss skydiver was one of them, but authentic is the other one. And I think that's kind of the biggest thing to me. I know he's probably not going to outrun authentic early on. So how is that going to affect him is my biggest question. Um, I mean, his form is there, obviously, a tad here in Necker Island, both ran very, uh, you know, flat races in the Derby. But fifth place finisher, Shared Sense, did come back to win the Oklahoma Derby uh, this past weekend. So obviously he, he beat a very good horse in that spot. That's the second time he's beaten him. This year, even more horses throughout the running lines that he's been beating that have come back to do good things. So I think even though I know he's probably going to be your, your second choice and he's going to be very well bet, uh, I still I just have a lot of questions. And uh, I I really wouldn't be surprised to see him run a, run a hole in the wind and win the race. wouldn't be surprised to see him fading down the stretch. It's, it's just a lot of question marks. He's, but nevertheless, he's going to be a factor purely because of his natural early speed. And I think the other horse, uh, the, the next horse, the filly we highlighted in the beginning of the show, Swiss Skydiver, also has a ton of question marks coming into this race. You can't knock what she's done against her old fillies this year. She's been super consistent, super good, has run so many good races. She won four consecutive stakes 
uh, including the grade one Alabama against three-year-old fillies prior to losing the Kentucky Oaks last start. She did run the really good second two art collector in the bluegrass, although she was beaten three and a half lengths. So it, it's not like art collector narrowly beat her Swiss skydiver was backing up in that bluegrass, but it was still a good effort considering the circumstances, but the Kentucky Oaks is really the head scratching race. You know, you can look to, and the excuse has been made for her coming out of the Kentucky Oaks, not necessarily by us, but by people in this industry that, you know, the, the rail opened up down the backside for her with uh, Johnny moving Gamine off the rail and Tyler Gaffleone didn't take the, didn't take the chance with it. Uh, you know, we're not going to, you know, micro, we're not going to micromanage that take super, on here, but you can definitely, that, that would be the one excuse you could find with her in the Kentucky Derby. Outside of that, she just got beat on the spot by a horse who I think it's fair to say was overlooked a little bit. You know, obviously you had people like us saying that she was a good horse uh, to run well underneath, but uh, definitely was overlooked in terms of winning the Kentucky Oaks. The one thing I will mention with Swiss Skydiver is a lot of people are super concerned about the jockey change to Robbie Alvarado. Uh, Swiss Skydiver runs for any jockey. So, and, you know, if you've followed her throughout this year, have gone back and looked at her charts, you know that she's run for so many different jockeys. So a jockey switch for me with her is not super concerning. Me neither. And Robbie Alvarado, I know he's not the same guy that was riding, you know, horse of the years, like curling at Mineshaft and, and winning all these big races on these big horses and He's won this race before, though, and I think that goes a long way. He knows how to ride this track. He's had an excellent race this year before. I'm sure, he, you know, percentage-wise, he's lost a touch, but there were riders in the Derby that have, you know, less recent graded stakes wins than Robbie Alvarado. So I think it's it's people are looking at it a little too hard. He's still a he's still a good rider, and he just hasn't been getting the good horses. And this is a good horse. We know that much. But now it's the question of can she she beat the boy? She ran so good to Art Collector. But if I have questions about Art Collector, then I don't know how much I could trust her against some other horses in this race who I also like, who are definitely more proven. And she's, she's very talented. She's very talented. I would much rather I've seen her, you know, take a shot in a race like the spinster where I know she could, she could handle that group with, and, you know, run a really good race winner, winner, close, close loss. But you even throw in the fact that authentic is going to absolutely drag her along. She's going to try to be, right up there with him and it's just it, we've seen her do it in races like the fantasy where she actually beat the oaks winner and uh somehow outran a crazy fast sprinter in venetian harbor but i don't i don't think she can handle these boys so um as much as i'd love to see her run great and hope that she kind of does unfortunately she's a look against for me and now we're going to get on to the number five horse thousand words a horse that i've really come around on in terms of opinions if you go back to my derby preview on him i was very cynical on this horse i didn't like thousand words going into the kentucky derby at all but with all the pace horses dropping out uh, prior to the starting gate it caused me to have to relook him uh, and you know it made me re- really say that outside of the the san felipe which is the race that i really knocked him on uh, which was the race that really made me think that he was kind of a fool's gold horse outside of that race he hasn't run bad obviously he had the massive amount of excuses in the oakland stakes ran the good second to Uncle Chuck in the Los Alamitos Derby, even though Uncle Chuck did get beat by Tis the Law very badly in the Travers. It was still a good second for him, and then the shared belief stakes was a, a good enough win for him. Obviously, we didn't get to see him run super super well in the Kentucky Derby because he did flip in the paddock beforehand, but I do think he would have run a very good race in the Kentucky Derby. Maybe not necessarily a win, but I think he would have uh, definitely been in the top five or six horses. And I, I think a lot more highly of him coming into the Preakness now than I do going into the Derby. I think that he's a horse that, you know, can sit a little bit close. He's probably not going to be up there challenging for the lead, but I think he can sit close. And if it's a not super fast, but fast enough where it's going to affect the likes of Art Collector, Swiss Skydiver, and Authentic, then maybe he's a horse that could run uh, a really good race and, you know, maybe even a winning race. So I, he's definitely one that I've come around on in terms of opinions. Yeah. I mean, this was a horse who I actually really liked going into the Derby. Um, I thought his winning the strip leap was so impressive. My, my biggest concern really is the time between races. He obviously hasn't ran since beginning of August with, with the incident missing the Derby. I don't worry about it too much with, with him being from a Baffert barn and obviously the, the horse is from that barn do perform very well no matter how much times between races um 
realistically, though, he is a little unproven. Uh, that, that form from that shared belief is not super strong. And uh, looking back at that low South Derby, uh, Uncle Chuck, we know what he did in the Travers. So th- there's, there's, there's certainly questions I still have. And then in terms of race setup, where is he going to sit? He won the shared belief going wire to wire. That was a brand new dimension that I really loved from him. Um, but I wouldn't love to see him do it here. He'd have to go up against a stable made authentic, a swift skydiver, art collector. So he's going to need to sit back. And my, my biggest knock in reality, I don't understand the move. He's throwing the blinkers back on. He ran four races with the blinkers, and his two worst efforts came with it. They took him off, and he showed new life. He was second in that low South Derby, won the shared belief. And I mentioned it in the Derby preview. I love, I think it's because the blinkers came off. He started running those good races. Now they're back on. I really confused by it um maybe it's maybe i'm just overthinking it maybe he did run better in those races but san felipe certainly did improve that and he already lost to authentic there and sure he had his issues in the oakland states when he face planted out of the gate but nevertheless was beaten thoroughly by mr big news in that spot so there's a lot of questions and i don't like him as much as i liked him in the derby uh unless unless a couple of these speed horses scratch out then then i really don't don't know how much of a chance i give him and now we're going to move on to the next horse, Jesus's team. Uh, coming out of the Jim Dandy, which is very weird to say, uh, the Jim Dandy being a prep for the Preakness Stakes, but a lot of the these races being preps for, for races that in any other circumstance never would have been preps. It's weird to say. In many circumstances, Jesus's team is a horse that's been very interesting, at least for me. He ran a really good he ran a really good second in the allowance race to Soli Volante, who I always have thought that Soli Volante is a horse that had some talent. Obviously, the Kentucky Derby did not prove that. But since that, he ran a good fourth in the Haskell. Although uh, the the horse that beat him for third, Dr. Post, has not really looked super strong uh, since his two good efforts the race at Gulfstream and then his second place finish to Tizzle Law on the Belmont Stakes. His Pegasus Stakes was a good enough second. Uh, I think very highly of Pneumatic. But, uh, you know, coming into this race off of a third place finish and uh, you know, I'm a little bit questioning him coming out of the Jim Dandy. I would have thought him run better. I, I, I would have thought a little bit better of him had he run second in that race. Mystic Guide, I think, is a, you know, a graded grade two, grade three level horse. I wouldn't necessarily say Mystic Guide would be uh, top level in terms of Preakness, which is why I, I'm super iffy on Jesus' team. Because I, I think on the one hand, he could run a, a good race. He's run some nice races recently. Hasn't been out of the money. Since the eight, since he won a maiden claimer at Gulfstream on the 18th of March, but at the same time, outside of the Haskell, he hasn't really faced the strongest company. And you know, there there was really that the top two horses, and really authentic is the only super strong horse coming out of that Haskell. I have questions about New York traffic, and I have questions, major questions about Doctor Post, and you know, he didn't beat those two horses. So I, I see angles where Jesus's team could run super well, and then I also see angles where he could just be a horse that's coming out of lower level stakes races uh, and and would be a horse that would not run super well here. So I think he's definitely a v- very wild card going into this race. He, he's an interesting horse. I mean, the, the running lines have been uh, you know, positive. He's ran really good races behind good horses, pneumatic, authentic, New York traffic, Soy Volani all in there. But going back and watching the replays, uh, there's, there's, there's just nothing that suggests he's going to run a big race. Uh, He's had really, I mean, what I was looking for was, can I find excuses for him? Because when you have a horse that's losing but running good races, you hope there's an excuse so you can find the, the, that that angle that would probably put him in the winner's circle with a clean trip. I couldn't find it for any of them. I mean, that Jim Dandy, he came off the turn pretty much in the lead, and he, he just got run down late. And I feel like he's ran a lot of races recently against a lot of tough horses, and I wouldn't be surprised if that was catching up with him at this point. I mean, uh, losing, I mean, losing a horse like Authentic, Pneumatic, even at Jim Dandy Field is pretty, you know, it's decent for, for that level. Um, but that's got to take a lot out of a horse. And for that reason, I, I think that's starting to catch up with him. And he looked tired in the Jim Dandy. And uh, even then, Pegasus and the Haskell, he was well beaten by horses that are already in this race uh, with no real excuses. So he's a look against for me as well. I just, uh, he has, he's not shown me something that showed me, showed me he'll improve and take that step up necessary to win or compete in this race. And the number seven horse that we're going to get to now is New York Traffic, who going into the Derby, a lot of people really liked him. He was a lot of people's wise guy horse. Uh, you know, he had run 
three really good seconds, and prior to that, a good third in the Risen Star at the fairgrounds. Uh, and he, he had been beaten by good horses. He was beaten by Authentic in the Haskell, and, you know, it looked like maybe a couple extra strides or, you know, maybe a couple other things go right for him. Maybe he could have gotten there in the Haskell. The Matt win, he was only beaten a length by Maxfield, who, if Maxfield had been able to stay healthy, Maxfield probably would have been one of the top choices for the Kentucky Derby. Uh, the Louisiana Derby was a good good second place finish for him, even though I, I would say of the four, of the three races that I just mentioned back to back, that was probably the weakest of those those t- three. He didn't really have anything in, in the stretch. He just kind of stayed in the same position he was, and he was well beaten by Wells Bayou, but good enough for him. Good enough third, even though he was run down in the Risen Star. But the Kentucky Derby was just a real turnoff race for me, and a lot of people have brought up the the angle that he lost a shoe and other excuses. I just, I don't really buy it that much. It just kind of seemed like to me a horse that consistently in lower level races wasn't able to get the job done. Going into the Kentucky Derby, I believe I mentioned this in one of, if not both of our Derby previews that, you know, he just had the angle of a horse that just couldn't get the job done. And he wasn't getting the job done in lower level races like the Louisiana Derby and the Matt win, which, you know, the Matt win was a great three, even though it did have some super talented horses in there. Uh, I, I would say Maxfield was probably the only horse that was maybe for sure better than New York traffic. And he, he still couldn't beat him there. He was getting beat on the spot by a lot of horses. And that was definitely a red flag going into the Kentucky Derby. And I think it showed with the eighth place finish there. I don't think that he is the type of horse that can run the race to beat top horses like your authentics, like your art collectors. And like your Swiss skydivers. So for that reason, I don't really like New York traffic, but I do see a reason why he could run somewhat good because he does run good races normally. Uh, and I think that maybe, you know, he does get a little bit of a break here, but not too much because this is a super talented Preakness field. Um, for, from that derby, I mean, I think most people really view New York traffic as a horse who's going to run well in the derby. And I know that there have been the excuses that we couldn't see which was the the lost shoe the nicks and bruises but at the end of the day he had everything go his way in the derby there was nothing wrong he said just off the speed that held he he did everything right and he just looked so flat rounding that turn and for for that reason i just don't i just don't see he's he's another one that's ran a lot of hard races as of recent sure that i mean he was second beating a nose by the derby winner in the in the haskell a couple more one more jump and he probably wins there great races behind max field and Wells Bayou, but really, there's that Derby was just such a such a bad race. That's the only way I can put it. He's been working great since then, um, which is a good thing. But I also don't love the trip he's going to sit. He is one of those in between type horses who, I mean, they like to sit second, but they're not necessarily speed horses. So, in addition to that, he's going to have to contend with Authentic coming over from his outside, probably trying to clear him. Um, I don't. One of my biggest knocks, I might have to say, is. I don't like, I mean, he's a horse that's ran well with a lot of different jockeys, but they really had to scramble for a jockey, Horatio Caramanos, who they picked up. He's not a bad rider by any means. He's um, he's a, a local rider who, who, who does really good things at, 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 at Pimlico and at Laurel on the Maryland circuit, but uh, he's not a great, I mean, I know people will not Paco Lopez tons and tons, but uh, at the same time, He's, Paco Lopez is very aggressive and it fits New York traffic very well. I don't know how much Horatio Caramanos really fits New York traffic in this spot. So there's just a lot of things I don't think are trending upward for this horse. And moving on to the number eight horse, that would be Max Player, a horse who I think it's definitely fair to assess about him. Every race he's run this year, he's looked better and better. And, you know, he had the the long time gap between the Withers and the Belmont Stakes. And, you know, we were questioning on this show whether or not he was actually talented enough to run a good enough race in the Belmont Stakes. He shut up a lot of people who were cynical on him going into that race. Ran a, you know, I can't say better, but uh, on par. And, you know, I personally think it was better, but it's not really something that I'm going to argue by. Uh, Good third, still third in the Travers behind Tizzle Law. And we we know how highly touted Tizzle Law has been this year. And then his fifth place finish in the Kentucky Derby was a super good race. You know, Every year you'll have horses that'll run, you know, from the fifth to eighth positions in Kentucky Derbies. And because the Kentucky Derby is such a weird race uh, for that horse in that position, it's a really good race running, say, a fifth through eighth in a race with 20 horses, more so than it would be running fifth in a race with eight or nine horses. And I think that that definitely fits the bill for Max Player. Max Player has, you know, like I already mentioned, been getting better and better each start this year. And I think he's sitting 
in the perfect spot to run a really big race in the Preakness. I think he's going to get a very generous setup. He closed into the Kentucky Derby, and I think if there had been more speed on, maybe not a winner, but I think Max Player could have closed significantly better in a race in the Kentucky Derby with a bit of a faster pace. And, you know, I really like Max Player coming in here. I think that he is set to run a big race if he gets the kind of setup that I think he's going to get. And I don't really think it's very uh, ridiculous to expect that he's going to get that kind of a setup. Yeah, and I wouldn't even say so much it was a lack of pacing. I mean, obviously, the speed did hold quite a bit in that race. But if anything, his big excuse in the Derby was being inside. He didn't break very sharply. And then uh, even in a, you know, a smaller Derby field, he did kind of lose ground on the inside when he got squeezed out by a couple other horses. And he was inside throughout, kind of to weave through traffic. Typical closing Derby trip, a, a, a trip that people would you know pinpoint and say, this is my Belmont horse. I think that's the, the same logic's being used for the Preakness, except I think it's valid. I think he ran a really good race. Um, I do think he probably needs to be a little bit more forwardly placed, not you know anything different from his style, but he can't be dead last. I mean, if it, even if I reflect to last year, last year's Preakness was a horse in there named uh, Laughing Fox, who closed really well. He finished fifth in the Preakness, but he was way too out of it early on to be contentious. And uh, I would be a little, I mean, I would be afraid for that same thing to happen to Max Player, considering. He does not like to show early speed, but race sets up beautifully for him. Um, I, I, another big thing I don't really like is uh, the connections did kind of say that the, the not having Joel Rosario, a jockey that was familiar with the horse, on for the, the derby did not help him. So I don't get why. Um, I don't think that having a new new jockey on in Pablo Lopez necessarily helps him either. Uh, so I think there's a lot of positives and negatives to weigh. He's going to get the setup. He closes every time. He's been losing to the, the, the best horses the crop can find. And uh, really, he just needs the, the race to go his way 100%. And I do kind of worry about that because I do think that, um, they're, that the top horses in this race are kind of dangerous. And the number nine horse is the Kentucky Derby winner, Authentic, a horse that you know, I think it's definitely fair to say that we've had to go back and really reevaluate what we think about this horse. You know, coming out of the Haskell, I don't know that there was any person in the industry that thought 100% fully that uh, this horse could get a mile and a quarter. Uh, you know, a lot of speed had to scratch out of the Kentucky Derby. There wasn't really any other sign on speed horse besides him. So I, I do think that that all did play a factor, like we talked about in our Kentucky Derby uh, post-race recap video. But at the end of the day, Authentic did something that I think most people thought would never happen, and that was a, a son of into mischief winning the Kentucky Derby. And he, he ran it very, very nice Kentucky Derby. We don't have to, you know, further go analyze into that race. But, you know, I think that he was very benefited by not having – a super fast pace early and while I don't think they're going to be burning it down the backside uh, in the pre preakness in terms of like 109 and you know super short fractions like that I do think it is going to be a bit bit of a faster pace than it was in the Kentucky Derby and I'm not really sure how I like that with authentic I do see reasons why he could be able to to run through that but I also see reasons why you could go against him Ultimately, if you really like him coming out of the Kentucky Derby and you think that he he's just freakishly talented because obviously he has to be for him to be able to go a mile and a quarter with the pedigree that he does have. If you think that he's freakishly talented and you think that he can run through anything, then be my guest. Go ahead and pick him because I don't I wouldn't necessarily think that you were using unsound logic if that is your your thought process. Yeah, and, and I mean, he has not turned a hair wrong since that hassle. Truly, I mean, he had worked beautifully up into the Derby and then won the Derby, obviously, and uh, that was a freakish performance. There's no other way to put it. You beat Tizzle Law, you sustained very quick fractions from an outside post, just in incredible and great ride from John Velasquez at the same time there. Um, and then, of course, coming out of that, what else does he do? He posts two bullet works at Churchill Downs as beautifully as can be. And the, out the biggest worry for me was him drawing inside speed and then when the draw kind of went through, I'm pretty sure it was the 2 9 and 10 that were 2 9 10, 2 9 11 that were left over. And he drew the 9 outside of all the speed. Everybody around him really is not going to try to outrun him early on. And he's, he's just going to have his, his, his ideal trip, barring any poor breaks, but he's never really been a horse that breaks poorly, other than the one omission being the Santa Anita Derby. But obviously, every horse is entitled to a bad start every now and then. So he's, he's really looking good. I think, um, obviously, the big concern is. He, he did control the speed of the derby, and he went fast, but fast enough for him to do his thing. 
is that going to be affected with the likes of Arc Electric, Swiss Skydiver? I would even say New York Traffic in here, those three. Obviously, all horses that can affect any kind of, of pace scenario. So that's that's the big concern for me. But everything else is, is a positive in my book. Authentic, he's going to be favored, rightfully so. He looks very dangerous. And the number 10 horse, the, the next horse we're going to get to, is Pneumatic, the final of three horses trained by Steve Asmussen in the Preakness. And Pneumatic is coming out of a very good win in the Pegasus Stakes at Monmouth. Uh, he he was in the lead at points in the stretch by probably something about like four or five lengths. And, you know, obviously was geared down by our friend Joe Bravo. Ran a really nice race there. Uh, you know, looking at some of his other, other races this year, his two good, his maiden breaking performance and his allowance win at Oaklawn uh, in February and April, respectively. Those are good races. His first stake start in the mat win. Uh, he was running it. We, we've already talked about Maxfield when we talked about New York traffic. He was beaten by those two horses, both of them. You know, obviously on their best day have run great races. And at the end of the day, he was only beaten a length and three quarters in that race. It was only his third career start. So I can definitely forgive a horse who in his third career start runs that good of an effort against obviously quality horses. The Belmont Stakes, though, is the race that for me, I don't love it because, you know, I don't see a lot of excuses for him in there. Obviously, he wasn't going to beat Tis the Law. But, you know, you know, if he if I'm going to expect him to come back and run in the Preakness, I want to see a reason that I can pinpoint to that I can justify him running up to the level of a, a win in a race like this. I'm not really sure I see that with the Belmont Stakes, but I do like him coming out of the I do like him coming out of the Pegasus. And I do think that, you know, I am comfortable with, with, with saying with him. Uh, at least the, the excuse that I can give for him is that, you know, maybe that, that was only his fourth career start and he obviously is another race in him that was a win in a state, even though it was a listed stake, it was a stakes win. Uh, and he did beat uh, horses who have run well uh, in stakes races in the past. We already talked about uh, Jesus's team, even though as seen on TV was no factor as seen on TV ran second uh, in the fountain of youth very early on this year. But, uh, you know, that was a good win for him, and he has had other good enough races. But at the end of the day, Pneumatic is just ultimately, ultimately a real head-scratcher horse. I think he's a horse that could, definitely should be considered underneath, but I'm not really sure how I feel about him uh, really high up in this race. And, and for me, development is also the, the most confusing race, and I think he was a little too close to the pace. Uh, the pace was really quick that day, 46 flat for the half mile. In any mile in an eighth race is really quick, and we saw how bad that speed faded. Other than tis the law, of course. Um, so that's my big excuse. And he was kind of wide throughout. Um, that Pegasus was a really nice race. Um, he's, he's had the perfect trip. Joe Bravo, especially, I, he he looked in the first sixteenth or eighth of a mile. He looked like he was in some sort of trouble because he he broke well, but then he got shuffled back by some other speed, and he had to take back, but. Joe Bravo did a really nice job putting him back in the race and sitting close to a pace that was pretty slow. Um, and then obviously doing what he did. He could have could have won by much more if he was asked for much more, but I, he really wasn't. Um, at least another length or two. And that was a really nice nice run. And then, you know, if we go back to that Matt win, my biggest thing with that race, he ran such a good third behind two really good horses. But he also was basically the pace setter that day. He was battling it out with a couple others. Um but he was up, and he was breaking from the rails, so naturally he had to show some early speed so he didn't get buried. But that was a dimension that he's never really shown in any other race, so he still ran really good. My hope here is that Joe Bravo um, sits, because the pace is going to be quick, he needs to sit the kind of trip that, that pneumatic was given by Ricardo Santana in his second career start. That race he sat about mid-pack, only about three, four lengths from the lead, but enough not to be uh, you know, taken out by any pace, but... And he's had a really good trip, and he finished very well, full of run. He's had to adapt to different circumstances in his last three races, and two times it didn't go so well, and once it went really well. So he needs to sit a little bit further off the pace for me to be comfortable with him running a good race. But other than that, I think he has a legitimate chance. And the final horse we're going to get to is Live Your Beast Life, who's coming out of a second-place finish in the Jim Dandy. Prior to that, was running in the Allowance Company uh, at Belmont at Saratoga. Won an allowance at Saratoga prior to that second-place finish in the Jim Dandy. You, you know, he's another interesting horse. You can make the same arguments that you made with Jesus' team, but, you know, he was 
uh, he, he was obviously better than Jesus' team in that gym dandy. At the end of the day, I'm not really sure how much I trust him. Uh, I, I just think that there's better horses in here than Live Your Beast Life, but I do respect people who do think that, you know, that Jim Dandy showed something. And if you really like that Jim Dandy performance, then uh, I, I can, you know, at least see something in it. But at the end of the day, I'm not really super high on Live Your Beast Life. I think that there's probably going to be better long shot options than him. Yeah, you know, if, I, I'm, if I'm going to give some positives, uh, this is a horse who's really improved since he got, was able to stretch out to two turns um, up until three starts ago, his five previous races. He'd only been going one turn and had not been going super well for him, um, in addition to losing just good horses. Uh, but then when he got up to two turns, it went really well. We go back to that allowance race three back. He set the pace. I uh, got tired late, lost to two very good horses in the process, both very injury-prone three-year-olds, so that's probably why they're not super notable, but good horses nonetheless. And then he started to come from off the pace. And I do remember the trainer, Jorge Abreu, saying um, that after that in, after that race in an interview, we know this horse needs to come from off the pace. It was our mistake putting him on the lead, which is probably why he's improved in his last two races. Um, and then another thing that's really positive is he was very, very far back, or he was far back in that Jim Dandy, and he closed very, very well, losing by less than a length, closing into a pace that was not quick. So he's been able to do that in his last two races, really. It's been impressive, but... Now, will he, the big question, obviously, can he translate that to tougher horses? Nothing on paper really suggests that. And uh, I was already off of Jesus' team. This horse wasn't much better than him on the day. So for that reason, I'm also off of it. But those are just a couple positives if you are considering that horse that might benefit you. And like we've been talking about, the pace is going to be quick in this race. Um, if it's slow, then I, I'd be very shocked, very, very shocked, like most people, to see slow fractions up there. So he is a closer who is going to benefit from that, that quick pace. All right, so now that we've finished all of our analysis on the individual horses for this, now it gets into our picks. And full disclosure, this has been really tough for both of us to figure out who we're going to go with because there's just so many different angles to go with in the Preakness. But ultimately, I settled on Pneumatic. I think that he, you know, Eric talked about the, the race that he had at Oaklawn, which if anyone hasn't seen that, the second race of his career, the allowance at Oaklawn Park, go watch that. That sets up really well for... You know, if he can get that same setup, it looks like it sets up really well for him to be far enough back from the pace that, you know, he's not going to be too far out of it, but not too close that he's going to be getting stuck in any kind of potential pace meltdown. Uh, so I do think that that could bode well for him, and I could justify picking him off of that. Uh, for second, I'm going to go with Max Player, just because, like we've mentioned, we do think it's going to be pretty quick up there, uh, and Max Player has shown that he does like to close into, you know, paces like that. And, you know, like we mentioned, the Derby wasn't only a pace thing. I think that he will run a, a, a much better race than he did in the Derby, and the Derby was still a really good race for him. So I'll go with him for second. I will go with Authentic to finish third because I do think that uh, Authentic, like I, like we already mentioned, is freakishly talented, and I do think he will hang around. Uh, it just depends on how long you think he's going to hang around. And to round it out, I will go with Mr. Big News to be fourth. <laughs> And for me, uh, I think I was almost overthinking. I just I don't want to overthink this race. Basically, I've looked at it a million different ways. I I liked Thousand Words. I liked Pneumatic. I liked Mr. Big News and Our Collector. They they were all considered. But at the end of the day, I I have to go with the favorite. And if you know me, it is very rare for me to pick favorites in Triple Crown races. Of course, this being the year, I I pick one in all three. Uh, but other than that, I I'm really anti favorite in general. But Authentic are just on paper. He's done everything right. I think that the mile and three sixteenths is uh, the less distance, the better, in my opinion, for this horse. Uh, the, more, the more talent we'll see from him. So I think that'll be really good for him. And Johnny D. Rowe so well last time. I don't see why uh, it would be any different this time, time round. And I know there's there's other factors in here that are gonna that are gonna press him a little bit more. But I don't think it'll push him over the edge. I think I just I feel like. Looking at her any other way is almost overthinking it, and for that reason, I'm going to go authentic on top for second. I will go the other back for a thousand words. Um, I'm just skeptical about the, the quality of the trip we'll get, but I know it'll be he'll save as much ground as possible, and for that reason, um, I think a lot of times we see you know presser slash soccer types sitting really good trips on the inside and uh, or saving ground as as much as they can at Pimlico, and that definitely benefits them. So I'll go thousand words second and third. I uh, have to throw in one closer, and I think Mr. Big News is the one I like the most of the bunch. So 
I'll go him for third, and and then uh, if I'm throwing in a horse for fourth, it would be Pneumatic as well. I think uh, the outside post is really just the biggest thing. I don't think he's going to be able to save enough ground for him to, to be a huge factor um, for the win, but I think he'll still run an incredible race like he always does. And with that, that is it for this Preakness preview, uh, like we usually do already. Always, we've got a ton of previews coming up for a very, very nice Keeneland card this weekend, as well as some other stakes at Belmont. So we'll have all those. Uh, good luck this weekend if you do decide to play the Preakness, and we will see you next time. Have a good one.